And thank you very much. I'd like to thank the Anglo-Turkish Society for the invitation. It's a great honor and a pleasure to be able to communicate with you and talk about my research. First question to ask for me would be, why the study? And let me give a little background to how the study came to be. I was hired in 1984 to teach at the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College, which would be, I think, equivalent to Kimberley in uh, the UK. And the colonel who hired me hired a bunch of experts, different parts of the world. And his philosophy was quite unique, I thought, at the time. He had a military faculty with a few civilians, but he wanted to expand to cover the globe. And he preferred hiring people who had no military background, just to expand the thinking of the military faculty. And I had no military background at all. And in fact, I had been a protester against the war in Vietnam. So when I went to the university in 68, uh, I was a protester against the war and even went to Washington DC to the big demonstration there against the war. So when I started teaching at the Command and General Staff College, I was teaching war veterans and I had been opposing their involvement in the war. Um, and the Colonel had a very clever way of integrating us who had no military background. He had money, so the first year at the college, uh, we didn't have to teach anything, but we, were tra we traveled to different uh, military schools. We were given time to read about military history. I didn't know, even know what a battalion was at that time, even though my dad was in the Polish cavalry when the war broke out, World War II. And then he said the fir first year of teaching would be teach army and politics in the Middle East, and then slowly move to the operational art, teaching military campaigns, tactics, armies, how they changed military culture and those things. So it was a gradual integration into the system. And even though I was an Ottoman historian at the time, the emphasis was going to be on studying the Arab-Israeli conflict. And I put together a course uh, on war in the modern Middle East and decided to include one lesson out of 10 on the Turkish War of Independence. I knew something about it, but when I went to the university, when we talked about Ataturk, it was about him, basically, the revolution that he created, the creation of the republic, the nation state. We did not talk about him at all as a soldier. And as I started to put some material together, I realized that I did not know him very well as a soldier. I read things in English, didn't cover the subject well. I looked at Turkish material and they didn't really do an incisive systematic analysis of his involvement as a soldier, looking at his military thought. And as I taught the elective, I had students from all over the world. We would have uh, in my elective, Officers naturally from the United States, but we also had British officers sometimes, Turkish, Greek, Arab, etc. And virtually every officer after that three hour lesson said, this guy was truly a genius. He understood how to wage war at that level, at the strategic level in the war of independence. So I realized there was this vacuum that needed to be filled but the Arab-Israeli conflict was with the focus of my research and publications. I managed to get an appointment for one year as a visiting professor at West Point with the idea of going back to the Command and General Staff College. And I used that position to apply for a job at Baylor University and, and they hired me. When they hired me, uh, I had now the freedom to focus in on doing research on Ataturk. And fortunately, some of the officers that I taught from Turkey became two three-star generals and I was able to get access into the military archives and to use my skills in Ottoman language to look at the, uh, the documents. And as I was doing research, I had this image of Ataturk as a very rational man, driven by the enlightenment, driven by positivism, driven by scientism. And toward the end of my research in Turkey, 
I ran across this statement he made, which started to puzzle me immensely. He said this on 15th of March, 1923. Perhaps more than reason, logic, or judgment, what makes history are feelings or sentiments. And all of a sudden, I started to be puzzled. And if you look at the date in which he made this public statement, it is March 1923. He has finished kicking out the Greeks out of Anatolia. He has not yet signed the Treaty of Lausanne. So he is in that no war, no peace uh, middle ground. And this is a statement that I think reflects a leader's perspective on what transpired during the War of Independence. He is speaking as a leader and he's saying something powerful about sentiment and feelings. So that got me looking at the material that I had accumulated with a slightly different angle. And I came up with the idea that there were three concepts that he used a lot. And the three concepts were the ma or mind, intellect, reason. The second one was feeling, sentiments, hisiat. And the third one was vichdan or conscience. And as I grappled with this, I realized that somehow emotions were very important to move people. And if you are following at all the United States and what we're going through, we have a lot of passion, a lot of fear, a lot of emotion, not much rational common sense thinking these days. So emotions can really consume people, individuals. So this became the framework for me to analyze Ataturk and try to understand what he meant by those three different concepts. And what struck me too is if you look at Kamal, the word means maturity or uh, perfection. To me, for Ataturk, it captures who he was, and that is a process of constantly learning, growing through knowledge. So that is something that gave me a lot of inspiration. When you think about uh, teaching at a university, you'd like to have a leader who appreciates reading widely and deeply about different subjects. So let me now turn to uh, some discussion about uh, Ataturk and what I discovered in my research and how things uh, changed. Here is Ataturk right here. And the question is, what is going through his mind? What is he absorbing? as a studying at, in Istanbul. We know his background, he came from cosmopolitan Thessalonica or Salonique. He decided he wanted to go into the military. So he, against his mother's wishes, got himself into the military educational system, which was a pretty profound decision for him to make. So I looked at the notes that he took as a student at the staff college with a heavy influence of Germans through Van der Goltz uh, and military thought coming out of Germany. Several things came out of the notes that he took. Listen to the questions he raised in his notes, which to me were profound, and they go into the nature of human beings. He asked the question, what does an officer need to know about the secrets of human nature. What makes people tick? That seems to be something that as a leader, he will continue to explore and grow in understanding. The second uh, question he asked, how do we teach the art of soldiering? Notice the word he uses, art, sanat. In other words, it's not a science. It's not a cookbook approach. You have to understand human nature, and then you have to work through the art of soldiering. And how do you do that? And in there is the recognition that a good officer has to be a teacher. And notice as he becomes statesman, he takes on the role of head teacher. So the idea of teaching 
is a responsibility that comes from his early military education, and he will do that as an officer before even the War of Independence. And the third thing that struck me is he asked, are events unique? If events are unique, there are no cookbook solutions. And if you think about emotion, I think one of the things that flows out of emotion is, and he'll talk about it and write about it, is the idea of calming your emotions and being able to sense, to have that intuitive knowledge, that sixth sense or kudoil, which Clausewitz talks about. So as I looked at these questions that he's asking, and he, in another place writes down that there has to be a superiority in political ideas. So in war, you have to be fighting for a noble cause. You have to have an advantage in that your political aims are better than your opponents. And all this speaks very highly of that influence of Clausewitz, where war is something that you can't control. Reason can only do so much, but you need to be able to develop an intuitive sense and understanding. And in there, Ataturk will talk about the idea of needing to understand sociology, psychology, to help to understand what motivates people in groups, what motivates people as individuals. So in another place he wrote, he says, know the physical, psychological, and social dimensions of human beings. And so when he's reading broadly, he's trying to get some insight into these important fundamental questions in the profession of arms. Okay. Now, let me now switch over. After he graduates, his first assignment is in Syria as a young captain. He obviously has excelled with his mind through the educational system to become a general staff officer and get that assignment in Syria as a captain. And what he writes out there in the field is really this is where my learning truly began. So you get the sense of the way he's gonna grow as an individual is by study, but also thinking and reflecting on experiences that he has, the people that he encounters. And this is an ongoing process for him. And later on during the Republic, he says, read until you die and respect your teachers. This is what he says to students. Now, he gets involved in politics with the Committee of Union and Progress. And then um, rather than being swept into politics, he stays, my perspective, a professional soldier. In other words, he is engrossed in doing things to reform the army once you've gained control of it away from Abdul Hamid's tentacles. And what struck me initially was why is he translating two manuals from um, Germany about small unit tactics, platoons and companies? And as I did more research, it made me realize, because he will say this later, is in warfare, what happens at the point of the arrow is where the first surprises come. And you have to make sure that you're training your soldiers, you're training your officers to do very well. And since he had two manuals that, of three that he translated that did that, he thought that this was gonna be a much more of a revolutionary concept for the army to focus in and rethink how it's training the soldiers. Because in Syria, he learned that the soldiers were not well trained. He had to assume more control over using them in operations than he would like to because the training just wasn't sufficient enough. So the point of the arrow becomes very important. Now, when you take it down to the, up to the strategic level, you start to realize that this is a mind that integrates things at high levels, mid levels, and lower levels. And it's this comprehensive approach, comprehensive mind that is at work. Some people have a real ability to be able to integrate different levels of activities into a better understanding of what needs to be happening and what is happening. 
his career includes service in Libya. Here I think of him sort of as a kind of a Lawrence of Arabia. He goes there, he doesn't speak the language. He comes from Salonika, an urban background, and now he's dealing with Arabs and Arab tribesmen. And what is interesting is he makes a very good adjustment. He understands that he has to learn from Arabs and how they fight, how these tribesmen fight. And I found a reference by an Arab officer who was out there in Libya. And he said about Ataturk, unlike Enver Pasha, the big gun out there uh, doing his thing, Ataturk understood the limits that you could have in terms of casualties. You can't expect Arab tribesmen to be mowed down as the British were at the Saal. So he always put into his orders to his officers be concerned for casualties and appreciate who these people are uh, and how they fight. And in there, he, in the middle of the desert, in a different culture, with a different language, needing translators, he wrote to a friend of his, he said, I love nothing more than the artistry of soldiering, going back to art but what kind of environment is he talking about? And when I was at West Point, an officer who said he was a redneck told me, you know how you know you have a calling to be in the military? He said, you're on a training exercise. And this is more than a training exercise. You know, It's a very different culture setting. You're fighting guerrilla warfare against a conventional army. And you're saying, I love the artistry more than anything else, all this, harsh environment doesn't take away from my calling to be a soldier. And what this redneck told me is, you're in a training exercise. You haven't had a hot meal for a week. It's cold, it's raining. You haven't gotten, even go to the bathroom, have a uh, normal bathroom. And you think, God, it doesn't get any better than this. In other words, all those obstacles that you're facing just compel you to take up the challenge. So for me, this helped to understand how committed Ataturk was as a soldier. And then we'll eventually see him as a statesman. So we're seeing really a deep thinking soldier who has a vocation to be a soldier and he can make the transition then to a statesman. This is why, why it, this is, all this is being important. Then I like to switch over into, uh, let me see here. Okay. Uh, he ends up as a military attache in Sofia. It was a good time to have parties. He's dressed up as a janissary of one of the parties. But he writes this book, uh, Conversation with an Officer and a Soldier in response to what his friend had written. And, I analyzed this, it seems to be glossed over by even people who do military history in Turkey. Let me point out a couple things that were very important. Uh, he talked about that you cannot really understand uh, what to do by just using your reason. You have to have this kind of sense uh, to take initiative when it's necessary. He reinforces that you learn in a unit and not just through reading. He puts emphasis on reason and conscience as driving forces. And when I thought about that triad of mind, conscience, feeling, usually I hear uh, read about mind and feeling, but if you do not have a conscience, you don't have an ethical system, your logic can lead you to a totally different path than if you have a sense of right and wrong, a sense of a noble cause, working for the good, willing to sacrifice. And those are the things that Ataturk talks about as goals with soldiering. In other words, values are also important in integrating what makes emotions tick in a person and how they reason logically and what perspective they take. And what was interesting in here, he identified three historical figures that really 
embodied aspirations of people. And I think when he becomes a statesman, he's going to try to embody what the new Turkey is going to be, what it's striving to become by trying to identify aspirations that are noble. First person he mentions is Moses. And Moses, uh, he says, tried to feed people of oppression and slavery. Seems like something he'll talk about. The second person, which amazed me in there, he says, Jesus. What did Jesus offer? Compassion for the poor. And that was something that really touched people and went beyond his own historical period. And the third one is naturally Napoleon and being able to make people motivated by the idea of military glory and honor. And in there, he talks about the idea that officers have to teach their soldiers and they have to be babas, fathers for their soldiers. And Baba is one step lower than Atta, Atta Turk eventually down the road. Okay. Uh, and what struck me is this is a 20 page booklet that eventually gets published, is how he ends it. Last three pages of the book are notes that he took of reports that were given to him by soldiers under his command that inspired him to sacrifice, to be better at soldiering. And the last quote that ends that booklet goes like this. It comes from an officer who is wounded. It says, in order not to break the morale of my troops, I will not withdraw from the line of battle. If I die, Ramsey is at my side. He will direct my forces. Very humanistic approach, isn't it? To death and destruction. And it's not his words, but words of someone else. Um, so, one can see that in his military career, his thoughts are deeper as they go along. He deals with the art of war, comes back to it at different levels as time goes on. And then comes war. He gets himself involved in the Gallipoli campaign. And here is the first command that he has that's of a higher level. He's commanding a division. What officers at the staff college said, if you look at his career, he's fighting tribesmen, he's mobilizing tribesmen. He's dealing with small unit tactics as a commander with the company in Syria. Eventually he rises to corps and field army. This guy has rich experiences, diverse experiences in staffs and in command. And this is pretty impressive. Our Eisenhower really didn't have, have much command until he got to be Supreme Commander, okay? So he's experiencing things at different levels. And one of the things that clearly comes out in this war is Lehman von Sanders is very impressed with him. And one of the things that Ataturk does in this one is he takes the division and commits it without approval from uh, his commander, ultimate Lehman von Sanders. It's the reserve division and to commend, commit it, you need to have the commanders above you permission, but he realizes things are desperate. Anzac is landing forces. I need to command troops to prevent them perhaps breaking this peninsula into half. So he takes the initiative with a sense of intuitiveness about the feel of how things might go. And uh, what struck me in this, that people will talk about, you know, this leadership in different ways. What struck me is he writes a letter to a friend who says this, I am living in hell. I am fighting for my humanity. Send me a list of novels in French to inspire me. I have an officer in Istanbul who can get those books. In other words, he's fighting PTSD, what we would say today. He's experiencing some injury to himself 
and he's self-conscious about he needs to fight for his humanity in this trench warfare that resembles what is going on in France at this time. It's not the maneuver warfare that you might find on the Eastern Front, Russians and Germans. Uh, so the idea of the emotional part, he experiences as something that could be very negative. They can create indelible wounds on yourself. He does very well at Gallipoli uh, and um, is given a command uh, after that, a core, which is higher. And what struck me was that at the core level, he um, takes time to write a manual for his officers, seven pages, it is simple, clear Turkish. It's going back to the basics of what war is about at the point of the arrow. What template does an officer need to have to help him make decisions? And in there, he is creating what we would say a command climate. He's letting officers under his command understand through this manual, which he demands that it's gonna be used and read, that they understand what war is about, how to deal with the unknown and what he expects of them. And he uses manual quotations, he cites historical examples, and he even gives what he has learned as a commander. And what he tells the officers is, your intelligence will never be good enough. You're never gonna know what you need to know about the enemy, what you'd like to know. It's that unknown. Okay, now uh, in their, during this World War I period, he talks about to the, uh, how, what does a good commander do with his officers to create a good climate, culture of command? He says, you have to work hard at knowing what makes your unit tick and what is the morale of your units. He says, you need to get together with officers and have friendly conversations to get an understanding of how they're thinking, to get an assessment of their character. In other words, you have to be a deep listener. And a deep listener does what? He listens to what is said, he listens to what is not said, and he tries to get an intuitive understanding of what body language is all about. So when I think about this dynamic and the idea of feeling, Feeling to me, out of that flows this kind of connection to people. And when you talk about mature sentiment, which is what auditor will often talk about, even in the Republic, you're trying to bridle your emotions, you're using your mind, but you're also feeling. And what we're talking about is kudoyo, intuition, that sixth sense. You're developing it by being conscious of your environment, conscious of people and growing and understanding who are these people you're working with. And we'll see in the Republic, the Sofra, the dinner parties will be important. And one of his uh, personal secretaries says he liked to drink, but he also knew that if he drank, people would ha have a looser tongue and you get a little more what they felt coming out than if you just had these formal meetings, briefings, blacks, suitcase or whatever uh, uh, going on. So he's still interested in exploring the depths of individuals as he's thinking in moments of solitude in World War I. Let me take a catch a little breath here. Uh, so his mind is uh, constantly being developed. He's reading constantly. And what is interesting in World War I, when he has time, he reads Romeo and Juliet. He's reading history. From an, uh, his high school days, he learns to appreciate poetry, literature. He's reading all sorts of different subjects. So his mind is developing as he goes up a higher command, but at the same time, He's trying to understand the world around him and not just military terms. And one of the 
teachers he had told him, and he respected him highly in Istanbul, said, you're going to be leaders. Do not study narrowly, but study broadly. It reinforced where Ataturk was, but it was an inspirational teacher who really reinforced that a good leader can read poetry, can read literature, and develop himself as a person and understand. And poetry does what? Does touch the emotions, does it not? Okay. Now, uh, so for me, then the feeling part, as he's developing it, is to bridle the emotions and to have that sixth sense to connect with people. And it is to inspire people as well with feelings of pride, of honor that he will be uh, uh, resorting to. So I would say that he is, has within him not only a sharp mind, but emotional intelligence. And he's working at it. It doesn't come just naturally, but he's always learning and studying as he goes along. Uh, the other thing that is, is the vichdan, the conscience. He will refer to that frequently. Um, and he will refer to it a lot when he is president of the country. It's the idea to appeal to values that drive you to higher aspirations. Because he always talks about ideals when he's president and then during the war of independence. So ideals are important to motivate people. And you have to think of the common good, a willingness to sacrifice. He talks about patriotism, honor, all those things are values that are important to shape the conscience. And what struck me when I was looking at him and what he was reading in Syria as a captain, going back then, is he read a book and he has four pages of notes on it, more than notes on anything else he has read other than military subjects, campaigns and all that is a book he has read in translation of Benjamin Franklin. And there are several parts to his notes. His first, he talks about, writes down the things that Benjamin Franklin did. His almanac, his diplomacy, lightning rod, all those things that he invents and does. So if you think about, Ataturk is impressed with the Enlightenment, the people from the Enlightenment, as a leader, in a way, Benjamin Franklin is better than um, Rousseau and others is because he's an actor and not just a thinker. And you could see then the next set of notes that he takes is he writes down auditor, uh, Benjamin Franklin's 13 virtues. And he has a statement for each of them. And if you think of what virtue does, it develops character helps to develop conscience. When it comes to silence, what Ataturk says is be attentive to oneself and to others, consciousness. In honesty, he says, never forget honor in every matter. And honor takes you to a higher level. So conscience will be very important to him uh, as he uh, develops himself. Now, Let me now switch over to the War of Independence. What is interesting is initially Ataturk will try to become defense minister in the cabinet after World War II ends. Uh, he doesn't get the position. There is an interview in a newspaper that his friend establishes and he interviews Ataturk and try to get him more, more aware by the public of who he is. Ataturk makes this argument why he could become a, gen, uh, a defense minister. He points to two things in his background that are important preparation for him to move into the political arena. His first thing he cites is his service as an attache in Sofia. If you think what an attache does, he mingles in parties, he meets high level people, military, civilian, which he was doing, talks to people in government, 
and has to make strategic analysis of what is going on around him. And that's what he did in his reports. The political involvement in the CUP, too young to really have a maturing process for that. The second thing he identifies is that as a senior commander in war, he had to look and understand what was happening at higher levels. This comprehensiveness that transcends the military and looks at what are the social economic effects. What is the policy that's being conducted in this war? I need to be aware of that. It is the wisdom that says, always look two grades above you and two grades below you so you understand what is going on around you. And what struck me is when he said that, there is a famous uh, report he makes in 1917, where he talks about where the empire is in September 1917. He says, we need to defend ourselves, get away from having troops in other fronts, go on the defensive, don't let the Germans run things. He says, lucky are those civilians who do not have the outreach from our government because our government is asking so much of them that it's almost turning them into hating us. That's a pretty powerful statement for a commander to put into his report. He says, there's poverty out there. There's corruption out there. What we need to do is uh, tighten our belts, not have any grandiose ideas, but adopt a defensive strategy in order to be able to survive. And let me just, he puts in his report, I thought this was pretty, shows that that literature uh, affects his eloquence. He says, war can reach such conditions that compel men of honor to separate themselves from sacred obligations. Beautiful but powerful language. This shows the commander who's thinking about not just the military uh, things, but what is happening on the home front? How is this a war affecting people? And to be able to see the suffering that's out there uh, and to be able to integrate it into a report. It would be like our people who are fighting in Afghanistan when we were fighting, our generals understanding what is going on back home and how this war is affecting in our case, we're being insulated and still living the good life, unlike what was happening in Turkey. Now, what I'd like to do is talk about his leadership in the War of Independence. This is what really struck officers when I was teaching them. And what they saw was really a thoughtful, serious, professional soldier, with such diverse experiences in combat at different levels and different functions. And now he has made a transition to being a political leader and blending that with his military. I would say that in this war, you can see Ataturk more like a Frederick the Great or a Napoleon in the sense that they are head of state, but at the same time, they go out into the field eventually he does and sees the battle as it's going on and making tactical decisions. He is not a Tsar who's way in the rear, maybe making some decisions in a tent far away, but he's actually on the spot seeing with his binoculars, getting a sense of what's going on and making decisions. And he assumes that responsibility in the war, which is pretty impressive for, for soldiers. What is impressive is that Honor Turk if you go back to that notes he had, politics and policy is so important in war. You have to have the right policy for an army to be able to be successful. And what he sees is we are in a struggle for our independence, our territorial integrity, our sovereignty. These are noble goals. So he articulates those fundamental goals in the Amasya Circular where he gets sent out as an officer by the Sultan and he lands in May. 1919. He's already in June uh, identifying what the resistance is going to be about. We want the unity of the fatherland and we want complete independence. We want to establish a national committee 
and we want to hold a national congress. In other words, we want to go to the people and mobilize them as first steps in our struggle. It is a mobilization of people because Clausewitz said war is a war of nations, not just of armies. And in his case, he's got to build that national movement. So um, he starts out there and then we'll hold congresses um, for uh, mobilizing the people. What is going to be interesting is first he starts out at Erzurum because the commander out there wanted him to start there and there was a concern that the Armenians might be trying to establish a state there. So he went there and had a little regional conference. They established a, a representative committee. He calls it a representative committee. In other words, I'm representing the people. That terminology tells you something about how he's understanding what the relationship of the leadership needs to be to the struggle. It needs to represent people and their aspirations. He's got to mobilize them to, to believe in what he's doing. The Congress he holds in Sivas becomes the national one where the goals are set out and the argument is we're, we're a national movement. The thing that's interesting is, you know, the attendance there is rather anemic. You can't say that he's really representing the people. A lot of the people just don't want any, war, any more war. But uh, the pressure is building so the Sultan Caliph allows for an election to reopen parliament. And this election that's held will bring into Ottoman parliament people who have accepted that noble set of goals unity of the fatherland, sovereignty of the people. And they will take that to Istanbul. So when parliament opens at the beginning of 1920, the national pact is articulated, voted on and accepted in parliament that those aspirations, goals are going to be what we're about. And the biggest turning point I think perhaps in this war is when the British and the French decide to close parliament, which tells uh, the people that we're not at all interested in self-determination. We want to impose our will and divide the uh, country according to our interests. By closing parliament, this has strengthened the legitimacy of the national struggle in Anatolia. So what does Ataturk do? He calls all those deputies who can escape Istanbul come to Ankara and we'll reconvene a new parliament. It'll be called the Grand National Assembly. And the Grand National Assembly will have its own uh, provisional constitution, which makes no mention of the Sultan or the Caliph and says power belongs to the people, unitary power in the hands of the people, nothing about an executive. And he will manipulate parliament to conform to his will. What is interesting he spends time with virtually every uh, deputy that's new coming to Ankara to convince them of what the resistance is about. As a former military commander, he is dialoguing with deputies one-to-one -to, -one to help convince them, to help them to understand what this is all about and what his vision is. And then what he tells the uh, one of his reporters, he says, don't worry, first the parliament, then the army. The allies have occupied parts of, the, of Anatolia, but they're unwilling to send in the army. So he has a safe haven in Ankara. He has time on his side and he wants to use the time to build up parliament, get a provisional constitution, establish ministries, kind of a parallel government to what's in Istanbul and put my main effort there so I can now build that legitimacy in Anatolia and what military units I have loyal to me, I can work with dealing with what's going on in, in around me. Uh, this is political wisdom of a person who's deep down inside felt the calling to be a soldier. What is also interesting, and in my book, the, the major 
biographies of Ataturk do not mention this. But in 1921, he holds an education congress in Ankara and invites teachers from all around Anatolia to come to it. And what he tells them is, we're fighting two wars. We're fighting a war with weapons against an enemy that's trying to conquer us. And we're also fighting a war against ignorance. And you are our soldiers. He's looking to the future and saying, education is going to be important. We're gonna to need to deal with the mind, consciousness, our worldview as we build the new Turkey. And as he's finished his speech on the 16th of, uh, I think it uh, should be April, no, before April, August, July, he has to run to the front because the Greeks are attacking and they've pushed the, defeated the Turkish army, the national army, and it withdraws to Sakarya. So you get a sense of these two forces coming together, a man in the midst of a conflict with the Greek army moving, defeating you, and he's articulating a vision for the future. Then he runs to try to deal with the front and then he comes back and he says, I'm willing to take responsibility, make me commander in chief, basically. So parliament votes him commander in chief for three months, gives him near dictatorial powers, but for example, the, any treaty that's gonna be negotiated has to be negotiated and accepted by parliament. But he, anything to fight the war, he's willing to uh, assume the responsibility for. And for uh, officers at the staff college, and for me, understanding where they're coming from, this is taking on responsibility in a transparent way. I'm gonna put on a uniform and go to the front and the responsibility lies with me. No excuses, we're gonna fight this at a critical moment with me in charge. He goes to Sakarya and uh, he will fight uh, that battle at Sakarya. Uh, so he has taken on the civilian clothes up until then from the first Congress in Erzurum. Now he's got the uniform. And in Sakarya, the uh, Greeks are coming. They're going to be attacking. There's a defense. And he is right here on the spot looking at what is going on uh, as best he can, moves sometimes around the battlefield. And there are the famous command that he makes is, uh, I'm not ordering you to fight, I'm ordering you to die. He does that at Gallipoli. To me, this command he gives outshines all the others in terms of it's not heroic, but it is him playing the role of commander, teacher, Baba, father of the army. And what he says in this uh, command is before the Battle of Sakarya, he says, to his army, especially to his officers. In a defensive battle, you can't hold every line. So he tells them fluctuations and reverses are going to happen. Don't worry, this is natural. What you need to do is if you see a unit pulling back, reinforce it, bring in infantry, artillery, anything you can to help support that guy because he's pulling back. What he's saying, and then he says, make sure you fight with mature tenacity, mature. Don't let your emotions go nuts. Don't go for heroism. Use your logic, use your thought patterns would be implied. So what he's telling them is, this is how the battle will be. You're gonna have to take initiative because things are not going to be nice that we can hold the line. There are gonna be reverses. You're gonna to have to, this is not a commander saying fight until you die as he did at Gallipoli. It's a different environment. He's changed his command. He's dealing with an entire army defending Ankara. And then this is what he tells his officers. I remind you the importance of during moments of intense combat, commanders must, caref must carefully exercise their duty and authority with mature composure. And they must avoid making decisions based on personal considerations 
and emotions that would impinge on the general situation. To try to calm down and reach out and emotionally and mentally prepare his army for what the nature of defensive combat is all about. It's a Clausewitzian approach toward war. Very sophisticated. When I showed this to generals in our army, they were a bit puzzled. It's not a command they would naturally give. Old? Yes. It saves Ankara. He gets renewed as commander in chief and he gets the title Ghazi. And there he is at a critical moment. Commanders around him are helping him. Fevzi Chakmak plays an important role in this one. So it's not all him. But to have people around you who can give you an input to help you fight the battle is what he's blessed with. Ismit Inanu, Fevzi Chakmak, and a couple other commanders. Then comes the big one. That is a classic offensive battle put together by the commander in chief, Ataturk himself. And it, it is kind of the pre-Blitzkrieg done with a single campaign without really planes, a few in the air, no armor, horses, but it is a study in the operational art of war, deception, and a beautiful plan. It's put together with him and his staff over a period of time. He takes a year to get the army ready. He realizes it, it, it's important to get the army ready. Uh, and there are so many... Uh, problems the army has. So he takes a year, and what he will do is he will attack on the southern flank, concentrate forces with the idea of the cavalry. I don't know if you can see the, uh, the arrow. Can you see the arrow going? That they'll go into the rear and uh, undermine from the rear. So the army will start collapsing, not because you're sweeping over them and killing them, but you've hit the rear and start to collapse, which is what's, what starts to happen. Uh, and he is here observing the battle. And sometimes he sends in specific orders what to do. And they almost encircle the army and they give chase to it. Uh, uh, and they go after it in, uh, as it fleeing toward Izmir. Here is the command I found on September 1st. Now, people will cite the last line, armies, your first goal is the Mediterranean, forward. They've almost encircled the army. The army, Greek army, what's left of it is escaping. And this is the order he gives. I want everyone to continue competing and demonstrating their mental powers and the sources of their courage and patriotism. And then he says, armies, your first goal is the Mediterranean forward. People don't analyze the sentence before it. And what is he saying? Use your minds, go after that enemy, and compete with it. It's a challenge. And what has he had done the day before? He has promoted his senior commanders one rank up. So he's given them a reward, but he, now he's telling them basically with that emotion and pride, honor, I've promoted you. Now prove that you're worthy of that promotion. Go after them. Beautiful timing, isn't it, for promotion? And he's not discriminating better commanders or less, less better commanders. Everybody at the highest levels is getting a promotion, basically, with a few exceptions. And then he says, whatever drives you for courage and patriotism, go for it. It is individualizing the command and the saying, I'm not going to tell you what to do in terms of a motivation. You know what motivates you, but it should be with courage and patriotism. It's a command that recognizes that the army is composed of individuals. Powerful. Then, when I looked at this command and analyzed it, what struck me is, on the next day, September 2nd, the official newspaper in Ankara is publishing this order. It is not an order just for the army. It's an order for the nation and for the international community. We've got them and we're gonna finish him. And at the same time, he gives a statement to the nation. He calls it the Turkish nation. This is nationalism starting to come out. So he has two declarations. 
One is the order that he's given to the army. One is an address to the nation and telling them about the victory, giving them credit for the victory. And both are done for domestic and international consumption. And as this paper is hitting the, let's say, the dirt roads of Ankara, the commander of the Greek army is being captured on the battlefield. This is crude oil at the strategic level that Ataturk talks about. It is an impressive timing to claim victory. You've promoted people, you've issued this command that's basically we've got you, go after them, individualized to for the individual to motivate them, whatever it takes. And then to go at the political strategic level to let the world know this is really timing at its best. So are you okay with another five minutes? Yes, I will finish up. Uh, so eventually Ataturk will hit uh, Time Magazine. Notice Time Magazine is right around the time he makes this speech about you know, the importance of emotions in uniform, but really it's the statesman that has really organized and created a parallel government, understood the relationship of politics and war, uh, and uh, taken over command of the army and being able to bring victory that is really impressive. And as he has won this uh, war, kicked out the, the Greeks, 1923, he'll take out before the Treaty of uh, Lausanne and give about 34 speeches before he only gave about 18 over three years and starts to give his vision. And as he gives the vision uh, to the country, if his audience is civilian, he'll wear his civilian clothes. If he's going to the army and look at its preparedness, look at what it's doing in terms of training during this time, he puts on his uniform. He understands that he has made a transition to being a political leader, but in crisis, he has combined the two and he's pointing to the direction of the future that he's going to be that statesman leaving behind uh, the uniform, but still being the soldier statesman. So in a way, uh, Honor Turk, uh, for me, really uh, changed my understanding of him by understanding him of as, as a soldier the importance of how he developed his mind militarily and always with that broader reading of things. His understanding of what makes people tick, emotions, how you can play with emotions, how you need to bridle emotions, and you need to address emotions in yourself and those around you to help motivate people. And then the idea of conscience, the idea that you have to have character, you have to have values, so that we're going to see a cultural revolution where you're gonna to try to change mindset, you're gonna to try to open up people more to expanding their minds, you're gonna to try to create a pride, but it's a mature pride, emotional pride in who you are and an identity, and you're going to try to create values that talk about sacrifice, the good for the nation, some of these things are ideals that I as an American would like to see from some of our leaders, that they understand reason, common sense, they understand how to appeal to motions in a right kind of way, and how when they talk about making things great, they can talk about virtues and values that go with that kind of greatness, so you understand what their vision was. And for Auditor, it was a combination of these that helped make him tick. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, George. Uh, excellent, fascinating insights um, into Ataturk. Um, so we've got time for questions um, and comments. And if you would like to say something, ask a question, please could you um, either turn on your video and wave uh, or use the raise hand function in Zoom or put your question via chat. And, and George, if you could uh, kindly um, stop sharing your screen and then we can see 
Um, or oh, stop share. Yeah, if you stop share, which I think is at the top, that's it. Okay. Excellent. So thank you very much. Now, do we have anybody ready to ask a question or make a comment? Um, if not, while you're thinking, um, can I, George, can I ask something um, about the influences or influencers on uh, Ataturk? Where, where did he get his, um, or did he have sources of influence, people that he particularly admired um, or, or, or you know, uh, manuals or, that he studied? Uh, there were many influences. I, I would say that he had a, an eclectic mind, so there were a lot of influences on him. For example, Damik Kemal and his patriotism, um, Ziya Gukop and his ideas of uh, Turkish, uh, uh, Turkishness. When it came to military matters, uh, he describes Van der Goltz as a scholar soldier. Van der Goltz was a big name in the German army, and he helped establish uh, the educational, reform the educational system in the Ottoman Empire. And the people that were teaching Ataturk were his students. And Ataturk read the uh, nation at arms by Van der Goltz. So he had a great admiration for Van der Goltz. So some of the things that I talked about, about the nature of war are really hand-me-down wisdom that goes to Clausewitz, to Van der Goltz, that is communicated to him and helps him to understand what war is about. And to me, maybe if you think about him as trying to become a soldier, he first really wants to develop himself as a soldier. So maybe these foreign influences in the military arena with systematic analysis of what war is about, bringing a theoretical plus a practical uh, analysis helps shapes that mind in the early period. So I would say the military influences were important for the theoretical and the particular approaches and the wisdom that they gave. So a, a leader doesn't have to be creative in his thinking. He has to understand how to use knowledge creatively. So I would say those would be very powerful influences on him in the period uh, as he's becoming a soldier. But then he's reading, you know, Namik Kamal. He's reading, uh, for example, Tafik Fikret, the poet. So there are poets that are influencing his thinking. The idea of patriotism, uh, national spirit are, are influencing him. He's influenced by science, uh, the idea of progress. There are there, some people will uh, talk about uh, enlightenment figures. He's read Rousseau. So uh, interestingly enough, there are so many different influences on him. But I would say in the early period, you have to give some due credit to the military. And the emotional part, I think, comes from Dupic, who was a French uh, officer who wrote about uh, what motivates soldiers, battle in, uh, in combat, I think was the exact title. Uh, so that's a French influence on his thinking in terms of uh, at the individual level, what makes people, because Clausewitz is at a high level and um, Van der Goetz is not quite focused on the individual. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so I've got a, a comment um, uh, from um, on the chat line. Uh, thank you, Professor Gavrich, for your great synthesis. Your key points are further supported and illustrated by Professor uh, Hikmet Ozdemir's recent uh, Mustafa Kemal the uh, Anadoluda Yokuluk. I apologize, I don't speak Turkish. On influences, I, I would also suggest Ernest Renan. Uh, do you recognize uh, those names, George? Yeah, yep. Yeah. I've met those. The, yeah. Um, okay. Um, any other points, questions? Um, otherwise, I've got uh, uh, another one. So there's a hand raised, uh, Elif. Would Hello. You... Um, my question um, is. Yeah, was he, because he, he seems, to, uh, Ataturk seems to have, I mean, ugh, is there, did he take the lead himself? Did he take what? Did he, like, w with all the uh, War of Independence, did he come, you know, that, you know, it says, like, it starts off by, you know, he, he went to Samson in 1919, and 
created this you know, uh, resistance movement. It, you know, it's, did he just automatically sort of put himself forward or how did he compare to other uh, generals or, you know, people at the time? That's a very good question. I, I think um, if you have more time, uh, you would develop that he has a circle around him at various points, uh, but he is, I would say, the most successful commander among his peers. And if you look at the people who are uh, involved in the resistance on the military side, they're basically roughly his age. A few are older than him, but he is the one who's built the reputation as a energetic, successful commander so that he stands out uh, okay. among the officers. Um, Kara Bekir gives important input, but he recognizes that this guy has a lot of gifts and talents, and he's always worried about him amassing too much power too quickly, and where is he going to go with the power as he's amassing it? So uh, it's not like he wants to replace him, but he realizes he's the person that's leading this, but we need to make sure that he doesn't go too far. So I would say he was probably the most talented, the most recognized. So he was a kind of a natural leader, but he developed, you know, this ideas and strategy in working with groups. I mean, it, so because it, it's from things like, you know, where you hear, you know, his famous speech at the end of the Gallipoli campaign about um, the Allied um, soldiers that have passed away in Turkey and how um, the, you know, it, it's, you know, his re his re uh, reconciliatory message to say that, you know, your sons are now our sons kind of speech. Um, it sort of, it, that always indicated to me that he's very emotionally um, mature in that, you know, he's not alienating and he's not trying to alienate and rub anyone's noses into any kind of a victory, kind of, you know, so he, Yes, I think it's a very good point. I, I didn't mention it, but it was in my book. Uh, when he um, confronts the Greek commander who's yeah. been captured, uh, he tells him, uh, don't be so sad. You know, Napoleon was defeated in battle. Yeah. As long as you followed your conscience and did the best you could, that's all that's asked of you. Yeah. That's showing respect to your defeated opponent. And then when he sat down, he talked with him, he asked him questions. Okay, what did you do here? What were you thinking here? He wanted to understand his thought processes to help him understand why the battle, the campaign came out the way that he did. He understood it from his point, but he's willing to show respect and say, okay, as long as you followed your conscience and did the best you can, think of Napoleon, look what happened to him. And then to talk with him about what did you do? What were you thinking? Why did you do this? What if I had done this? It's a kind of an after action. Let's talk with the enemy and learn from each other. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, got a couple of uh, comments on the chat. One from Jeremy. Yes, thanks so much for what was an extremely interesting talk. I had no real sense of the man as a thinker on the battlefield and in the military arena. And now I do. Um, and another comment from Mehmet Ali uh, Dick Erdem. Um, again, according to what I've read through Ozdemir's various books and Atatürk biography, he was incredibly talented in picking his team, so to say, and appointing tried and tested people to key functions, military and otherwise. Um, is, is, that, is that your sense as well? Yes. Um, he. Um... He created a command climate and um, he was able to get good people around him uh, and knew, knew how to use them so that you can have a sense of uh, that they would be able to give input and not feel like I had a colonel who was a boss when I was at the staff college. You know, if, if someone said the colonel says this, nobody questioned him uh, because it was always top down. No. 
And as he's, um, what struck me, I'm, I'm a Polish background. So I picked up on this. When one of the uh, people visits him during the War of Independence, I think it was in Sivas, uh, there is a Rustem there who's a Polish background, converted uh, parents, I think, converted to uh, Islam. He's been ambassador in uh, Washington, D.C. for a brief period. And I think he's around Ataturk a lot. He is a diplomat who's helping him to understand the, the, the arena of diplomacy. So he's got people that he picks along the way to help him understand. And then when he's president, he can go and say, I need someone who understands language. I know historians. So he brings in these experts. He's not intimidated in bringing experts in there to pass through and be uh, voices of expertise to help him make decisions as he studies himself. And then he has some people that are more uh, reliable friends that he keeps around. Uh, and they're of different persuasions. Some are of higher character than others, but I think from my point of view, this is difficult because life is hard, life has its darker parts. I mean, uh, think of the kinds of battles and wars that he went through. Think of the carnage, think of him struggling for his, uh, not sanity, but certainly for uh, his well-being at Gallipoli. There are people there that were hard-nosed, ruthless around him because uh, politics was ruthless. There were rebellions. So he had to have people who were firmer. Inanu is a hardliner. Then there were others who were softer. So he has a kind of a mix. And uh, that mix helps, I think, him. For example, that uh, statement that I read about him, the report in September 1917, uh, Ismet Inanu claims basically, Ataturk sat him down and says, this is what I want in a, in a report. You write it down. And then I'll go over it, and he goes over it. So you have us speechwriters who help him. Uh, they're not speechwriters, but they're colleagues who work together with him for speeches, and he uh, uses their talents because he can't do everything. So yeah, I think his ability to gather the right kind of people around him, uh, and some of them have to be ruthless, unfortunately. That's the times uh, help explain him. So it's not just him. Building on that and thinking about um, you know, the formation of the nation. I mean, he's quite a radical politician. Um, was um, it his vision, uh, and he had a good team who supported that vision, or was it a collaborative vision for which he was the leader? Well, I think it would be a collaborative. Um, and I, he doesn't have quite necessarily clarity in everything that he does, uh, how it's going to turn out. Uh, he has a sense, and I think I like the idea when he puts his six principles together, they're arrows. You know, shoot them out and they, they head and you follow them. Uh, so he, it, it is a collaborative effort where he has to make adjustments to how things uh, develop. And um, for example, I'm not sure if he's ever thought of, I need to create a historical society. But as time goes on, uh, he needs a much more uh, directive approach toward developing a national history. So he makes some decisions along the way to do that and create a uh, historical society. He creates a, a language, uh, a, a linguistic society for, for the reform of the language. So there are people along the way that help influence him, uh, but he, he's moving in the direction of nationalism, language reform, those things he's developed through reading others and uh, talking to people. So it's a collaborative effort. His genius is to pick and choose and develop, sometimes ahead of the, the decision, sometimes as, as events unfold. And, and what was he like as a negotiator? Or was that something that he delegated, you know, thinking about the, the end of the war, the Lausanne Treaty and so on? I think, well, that was, he picked Ismet Inanu to do the main negotiating. Uh, he was involved in, in how things uh, developed uh, in details, uh, but he left it to uh, Ismet Inanu to, to do the actual negotiating. And he had to give a certain flexibility to him and uh, come to a realization of what was possible, wasn't possible. 
Uh, some people said he could have done more, but I think he uh, eventually had to rely on Ismail to get a sense of what, where negotiations were and what he could take and what he couldn't take. Okay, thank you. So a man of compromise. That's what we mean. He had these borders, for example. He said, these are the borders we're fighting for at the beginning. And then when he gives up um, uh, certain areas like Antakya, he says, well, wait a minute. You know, we didn't set these firmly that that's where we have to end up with. We'll negotiate. But look, in our negotiations, we've done what? We've got a Turkish flag. We've got the language. And we'll work it out that we'll eventually get it. We're... Um, the uh, demilitarization of the straits. I mean, that's something that it probably he didn't want, but he realized he needed to get. And then he's there to uh, take advantage of evolving diplomatic situation in 1936 to get control of the straits. Okay, thank you very much. Any other uh, questions, comments? Um, I, I mean, last, last question for me. Are there any more records that uh, you can access? I mean, these are uh, notes kept in the military college, but are they in a form of a journal? Is there anything more that you hope to draw on for your next book? The problem with the next book is the presidential archives are not accessible. Uh, so who knows what's in them so that um, I've been able to get access into the Republican archives. Uh, the military archives do have some things that cover the period of the Republic so that uh, those are there. Uh, I am relying a lot more on his speeches. The one thing I think that is interesting about Ataturk is that he was an educator. He saw himself as educating the people. So his speeches were not just political speeches with claiming only uh, things that he'll not achieve, but he was trying to educate people what he was doing, why he was doing uh, things, so that there is a lot more substance in his speeches, and then there are the memoirs and outsiders looking into him, so that uh, I think for me there there are some very good insights of people around him, outsiders and, and uh, people who are Turks and, and, and other nationalities, that give you insights that we could draw upon uh, in analyzing him. Yeah. Okay, um, thank you very much. And this is anything else anyone would like to say. Um, can I thank you very much on behalf of the anglo Can I ask one question? You may, of course. Uh, how would you translate Irfan or Dusu? Okay, I'm gonna to defer to someone who does anybody want to? Um, I, I didn't catch the surname properly. Irfan. The, Irfan Ordusu, the oh. army of the Irfan. I don't know. Army. <laughs> or like... So uh, from Mehmet Ali uh, Dikerdem, um, Army of Enlightenment is proposed. Enlight Do you like the word wisdom? Um, I think so. Uh, uh, enlightenment is, of course, I don't look. I don't look. I know. But the the enlightenment, I think the uh, irfan or the su is also to uh, to give, to reconsciousize, re reconsciousize a peasant population in order to establish some kind of uh, push towards uh, enlightenment, uh, kind of Western understandings of enlightenment. Then the, because the question comes, I can't, I can't remember, it, uh, it's Tefik Fikret. You found it, you found it, Hur, Vijdan, Hur. Yeah, Irfan and Vijdan, Hur. So in and then Irfan. Also is, is uh, there, in, in that sense, it becomes reason. Good old, good old fashioned uh, Irfan, a, co uh, a combination of reason and knowledge. And fik Fikir would be thought, right? Fikir is, is, is more abstract, yeah. That, 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 would, be, that would be thought, it would, that would be concept. But the idea is good old fashioned 17th century 
<laughs> enlightenment, to seize the moment, as it were. Okay. So yeah. it really, and, and, and the one also thing that... Uh, it's Kantian. I, Kantian. Separe aude. Dare to think. Oh, Separe oh, dare aude. To, dare to think. It's very okay. Kantian in that sense. Okay, and what about uh, Ilim Verfen? Well, that's, yeah, Ilim in that sense uh, has the connotations of, uh, uh, of reason and positivism, as, 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 as you noted, you know, very, very aptly. Uh, Fen is, is, is science, I mean, a good, good old fashioned science. And of course, we know Atatürk's um, great fascination with geometry. I mean, and then, yeah, yeah, in that, in that so that, that his understanding was uh, calculation unlocking the secrets of nature by using mathematics, which is a good old uh, 17th century enlightenment idea in that sense, which also fits in with the, with the, with the, with the kind of um, secularism in which you accept that God has created the world and you say, okay, that's fine. Now let's get on to knowing the world, to grasping the world. So that, that in, in that sense is a, is a kind of pantheistic secularism, which you also, uh, I think, accepted at the time. Yeah, it, it, as an outsider, the, some of these terms are very difficult because they <laughs> have different connotations depending on, on who's it using gets lost, them. It gets lost in lost. translation, as they say. That's why it has to be contextualized within the intellectual traditions of uh, both intellectual traditions. And sometimes so a person can use the same term in, in, in a different Indeed, connotation. As, as in Devrim, as in Devrim. Is it Atatürk Devrim or is it Inkilap? Because right, a, lot my, right. a lot of my friends were tortured uh, in, in the 70s and then later in the 80s for saying it was Devrim, whereas <laughs> we, we were told that uh, to, to refer to it as Inkilap. You are also Inkilap. tortured if you refer to Atatürk as Mustafa Kemal and, and, uh, and, and had a picture of him with a kalpak, or was he Büyük uh, Atatürk? So there are all these, these nuances which have to do a lot with uh, like the, the shape of your moustache in the 1970s and the 80s. Yeah, well, you would appreciate this. I was raised speaking Polish at home. My dad was in the Polish cavalry hmm. uh, in his 30s when World War II broke out. And I was raised with math was the best subject, yes. that it taught you logic, re logical reasoning. And he would always give me problems to solve. Sometimes my, my high school math teacher couldn't solve them and we couldn't, but he'd dig up these problems. And I went to the university as a math major and then quit and decided I wanted to study people. But uh, math was so important in terms of developing a way of thinking that influenced how you looked at the whole world. And it's not necessarily mathematical, but a, a logical approach. In, indeed, I mean it, it also chimes with with the, um, the, the the slogan on on the Brazilian flag, you know, which which is uh, it's it's uh, it's uh, it's from the positivist um, group in France, which is, which which has to do with union and, and progress in that sense, you know. It's, it's that, that that whole notion of using enlightenment and positivism uh, and 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 uh, mathematics and so on to make this, this peasant society leap towards uh, a, 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 to, towards catching up with, with, with the century, with the 20th century. I also do have a feeling that Auditor sometimes said that he questioned how well uh, intellectuals understood as well. So that it's not just the peasantry, but we all need to think about how we think about ourselves in the world. And that's, that's where Jakub Kadri comes in, Jakub Kadri and his novels. Right, how yeah. to translate Ataturk's ideas and reformism and, and his version of nationalism into a political program. By the way, I mean, you'd probably read this, but this is, this is a good kind of, uh, it, it, he also uh, names the, the books which have, uh, 691 books which have influenced <laughs> Ataturk's thinking. It's, it's a very interesting um, uh, work on uh, Ataturk's reading and his intellectual um, sources. Yeah, but the one, if I may... Yep. Uh, may uh, a couple more minutes. <laughs> Pardon? <laughs> should we well, finish? Well, no, no, uh, carry, carry on, carry on. But uh, we, we sort of should wrap up in the next five minutes. 
Uh, okay. Um, I wonder though, in, in, in studying Ataturk from the military point of view, and then as a leader, uh, I wondered if maybe Shukru Haniolu was a bit too, too intellectual and narrow on his focus. For example, if I read uh, uh, Thomas Carlyle and Great Men, Heroes in History, you know, Ataturk is underlining other things than, you know, what we would consider uh, scientism, that uh, he is reading uh, poetry, he's reading literature, that uh, a leader is kind of asked to deal with, how do I motivate people? How do I understand people? Nationalism, scientism, all that uh, can help in terms of direction in some ways, but at the same time, it's incomplete for a leader. Yeah. I would say. Absolutely. Yeah. Does that make sense? Uh, it, uh, absolutely, because I mean, you, you, you picked up on his emotional intelligence and the fact that he, he actually went and spoke to people and actually lived in certain areas. And he, uh, he knew about Kurdish tribes. Uh, he, he knew yes. about um, Arabs in Syria. And he was an incredibly curious person. Yes. And, and everywhere he went and, and worked with people, he also selected them later for specific functions, either as civilians advising him or as military commanders. So he was, yeah. he was very good at picking people in, in particular contexts. Right. Yeah. Excellent. Um, thank you again so much, uh, Professor George Govrish, and uh, also for uh, the audience of the questions and comments. Um, and uh, you know, we very much hope uh, that we'll see you again on you know, one of uh, our events. Um, but uh, thank you for this wonderful insight, uh, a new insight for me, certainly, into um, Ataturk. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.